Thank you, Cindy, and good morning, everybody. Uh, our speaker today is David White, originally from West Texas, but now from Durham. David is a retired mechanical engineer who spent his professional career working with uh, an environmental consultant, consulting firm here in the area dealing with air quality from fuel combustion. He was chair of the Piedmont chapter for seven years and is currently our treasurer. Uh, David uh, organized two national meetings for us, one in 2013 in Nashville and another one in 2017 in Durham, for which our chapter made tons of money for which we were able to support speakers here at our, at our meetings on Saturday. David has been on the board of the North American Rock Guard Society for one term and served on several committees. He's now serving on the uh, Tours and Adventures Committee. Uh, he's been guarding for 35 years uh, and since 2000, the year 2000, he and his wife Carolyn have taken trips to 80, I'm sorry, 60 countries around the world and have visited 180 gardens and natural areas. He's here today to tell us about a trip he took last spring with his wife Carolyn, who's not here today because she's heard all these talks before, he said. <laughs> uh, to tell us about a trip to Great Britain and Ireland. So please welcome David White. Can you all hear me? Yep. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, I uh, hadn't really thought about it, but the uh, Bobby's introduction in terms of what I did for a career is basically I worked as a project manager, which means you, you've got a schedule and a budget, uh, and there's a lot of things in life dealing with gardening or other things that have nothing to do with mechanical engineering that deal with schedules and budgets and scopes of work and other stuff. So putting together a, an annual meeting or other stuff is of my, my uh, bailiwick, giving talks on to a botanical group is not. <laughs> but uh, I came to realize that to a large extent, uh, you can either be a great botanist, which I'm not, or you can have an appreciation of gardening and going to other people's gardens and, and uh, natural areas. And so that's kind of what I have somehow got myself into as a kid from West Texas. I uh, guess I will comment that uh, if you go on TripAdvisor or Cruise Critic and look up posts by NC Garden Traveler, that's me. Uh, when you talk about garden traveling, you know, there's really two things that are important. One is being at the right place at the right time. You know, there's no reason to, if you're going to go someplace, Gardening is one of those things that you just can't go any time of year. You really need to think about when you're going and, and what you want to see. And the other thing is, uh, it's really the people you meet along the way. Uh, gardening to me is a pretty much a social activity. I think it's why I joined this chapter to start with, is I had gardened previously just as a solitary gardener. I realized that there's a lot of benefit to, to being around other gardeners. Gardeners are basically nice people. Uh, and that uh, those contacts you make with people is very rewarding. Uh, when I first said I would give this talk and use the term British Isles, uh, Bobby Ward was very concerned that I make clear that the Irish don't like the term British Isles. Uh, Ireland is a distinct country. Uh, there's four other countries, sometimes called countries, I think they're more like states or provinces, that make up uh, the United Kingdom, which is England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Uh, we had been to the UK before, to, to, to England, and my wife's uh, father's family came from Scotland. So I've been to uh, the United Kingdom and Scotland before, but had never been to Ireland or Wales, so that was part of the reason I wanted to, to do this. Another reason is the NARG's Tours Committee had put together a tour to Scotland through Brightwater Holidays, and it was visiting rock, garden, rock gardens <coughs> in Scotland. And its schedule was really based on going in late May, first part of June, to, uh, to get the peak time for, for 
for visiting rock gardens in Scotland. I originally wanted to do it, but it filled up so quickly, uh, I ended up uh, dropping out so that somebody else could go. But at the same time, I had made other plans to go. And so we, uh, the, the, all the uh, little markings on here, the little stars represent places we went during the, the time we were in in the UK. Uh, and we were there from, we actually went over late May because I had talked to the tour guide in the Durham, which I'll talk about later, and he said, if you really want to come see a lot of the classic plants of the Burren, you need to come in May. We actually went late May, but due to flight delays, scheduling issues, after we left here, we ended up, rather than spending two days in the Burren, we had about two hours in the Burren in May, and we had also planned to come back in June anyway. So we uh, were gone from late May up through the, uh, the 23rd of June. Uh, the first place I'm going to talk about is Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. It's 350 years old. It's the second oldest botanic garden in the, in the United Kingdom. Uh, my, Saw it was the second oldest, I assumed Kew was the oldest, but the, the oldest botanic garden in the UK is a medicinal herb garden at the University of Oxford. Uh, Kew, which people think of as being the classic English botanic garden, is actually much younger, about 100 years younger than, than the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. Uh, there's 100,000 different plants in 70 acres. There's a number of greenhouses. I'm going to talk. This is the entire property. Just hit the wrong button. Wow. I'll get there. Uh, I'm going to talk. It's a large area. I'm going to talk about the rock garden, the woodland garden, and especially the alpine garden. Uh, rock garden and woodland garden, it's a very Nice rock garden in terms of dwarf conifers, a lot of small annual, small perennials, uh, some very large rhododendrons. Uh, you can see the two guys standing next to this rhododendron. Uh, the woodland garden also is a marvelous place in terms of uh, perennials. I think one of the classic plants people think about when they go to uh, Places like Scotland is a chance to see Mechanopsis. Turns out that Mechanopsis isn't a single species, but there's lots of there's a number of different uh, species within the category within the genus. There's also a number of different cultivars, which I'll show pictures of. There's also the Cypripedium, Dodecatheum, and a number of other things. Uh, I thought the Alpine Garden that was there was especially nice. This is my wife, uh, Carolyn, in the picture. Uh, it was dry the day we were there. It was cool, but it was dry. I thought this patio area with uh, troughs and rock garden plantings within this patio was a very nice design. Uh, one of the nicest uh, crevice gardens I had seen, uh, and just for what I think of as a traditional rock garden type layout. It's, it's uh, I probably spent more time there. It's a very small area, but uh, full of very interesting plants. Uh, when I said that there was a NARCS uh, tour there at the same time, uh, it was a tour that extended from May 5th through June 3rd. It was led by Julia Corden, who's, who works for Brightwater Holidays. There were 20 participants, that included Amelia Lane and Richard Lane. Uh, I've got a f several pictures here that Amelia gave to me that she took while, while she was traveling. Uh, they visited the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh and in Logan, which is down on the southeast, southwest corner of England. A number of public gardens, uh, a number of uh, private gardens as well that were 
developed and maintained by members of the Scottish Rock Garden Club. There was also a pre-trip that went to the Royal Horticulture Society Garden at Wisley and also went to the Chelsea Garden Show. Uh, it's basically the, the uh, arts tour, like I said, hit Wisley and Chelsea and then basically started out in Edinburgh, went to the Royal Botanic Garden and then made a circuit and then back down to Edinburgh. Over a period of time, uh, the pictures that, that I just showed were taken on June 2nd, which turned out to be the way the schedule worked out, ended up being a free day in Edinburgh. Uh, they, the group had also been to RBG Edinburgh, which I realized on this was I had left the H off of Edinburgh. Uh, somebody gave me a, uh, that was, uh, I was put together, uh, and I've got a, uh, one of the pictures is Amelia. Uh, I grew up in West Texas. Texans like to think that things are big, but Gunnera in Scotland is definitely big. Uh, visit a number of private gardens, a lot of troughs, a lot of, of uh, I think, classic uh, Scottish rock gardens. Uh, one of the gardens they went to is called the Explorer's Garden. These are all within what is generally referred to as Mechanopsis, but the Explorer's Garden has the largest collection of Mechanopsis plants of any garden in the world. Uh, some of these are simply different cultivars, some of them are different varieties. Uh, but this one, as opposed to the first picture, which was very blue, the uh, the, uh, the poppies here have kind of a purplish pinkish cast to them and then there's some that are that are very pink or purple uh, also went to a uh, just point out two private gardens uh, one of them you can look at and say well it's a nice rhododendron in front the mm -hmm. tightly cropped evergreens in front but the reason we went here was for the house next door. Uh, and I would point out that as opposed to having a solid paved driveway, there's plants growing in the middle of the driveway. Uh, as opposed to a, a round meatball, there's a spiral topiary evergreen. Uh, at least one person in the room here probably recognizes this house. Uh, person walking out the door here is Ian Young, who uh, Ian had spoke to our chapter a number of years ago. We hosted him when he was here, and Carol and I, he offered Carol and I a chance to come visit his house. If you looked at the Scottish Rock Garden International Bolt publication, uh, Ian and Maggie put that publication together on their own. Uh, they have a house that started out as a duplex. I ended up buying the other half of the duplex, not because of the house, but because of the yard. <laughs> uh, they needed more room. Uh, but Ann has filled the backyard with planters, troughs, uh, and, a, and a small greenhouse. He makes these troughs and planters out of slabs of concrete that each slab is heavy enough, I wonder how he manages to lift them, but then he bolts them together hmm. such that they're, you know, they're hundreds of pounds. They may be a ton by the time he gets it all put together. Uh, as you can tell, we had several days with wet weather, but you can kind of see some of the, uh, you can see the, the size of some of these containers that he's got. He's got water gardens, <coughs> small ponds and built in some of those. And he's constantly thinking about what else can he build and make and redo. Uh, we went from, from Scotland. We, we first went to Scotland because of Carolyn's uh, dad's parents' family, which still has a farm up in the northeast corner. 
to Scotland. So we spent several days there. We came down to Inns, and then we flew south to uh, to London because we, in the process of putting this trip together, like I said, at one point thought about going on the, the Nargs tour, uh, but then said, let's do something. Being a garden traveler or a traveler in general, I'm always thinking if I'm going to get on a plane and I'm going to go to Europe, what else can I do while I'm there? We had, <coughs> we wanted to go see Carolyn's family. We wanted to go on the Args tour. But we also found a cruise that went from Southampton to Dublin. And so uh, when we backed out, and when I looked at all that, I said, man, this is going to take almost four weeks. And I really can't afford to, the time in, to be there for that long. So we dropped the Args tour. But still, want, I wanted to go to Wisley, which I had never been to before. Wisley is relatively young compared to Kew or to Edinburgh. It's only 100 years old, but it's it's quite large. Uh, has a marvelous rock garden right up in this area here. As you can see, there's a lot of other stuff there. The you can see it was not only raining in Ian's backyard, but it was also raining in Wisley. Uh, and for those of you who went to the Green Swamp, you'll recognize the uh, Saracena that are there. Uh, but a very nice hillside, nice collection of, you know, just spatially nice uh, organization of the garden. Uh, they have the rock garden at the bottom of the hill, the top of the hill, they have an alpine garden, which again has some very nice crevice gardens, traditional rock gardens, very nice place to, there's also some, uh, some houses, in terms of, of alpine houses up there. Uh, from there we went to, to Nyman's, which is part of the National Trust, everything in all gardens in the UK seem to have either Royal Horticulture Society, National Trust, Royal Botanic Garden, different terms associated with it. This was on, uh, and I point this out for somebody who's a garden traveler. Sometimes it's like, how much can I fit in a day? Uh, we showed up at Nyman's at 10 a.m. because that's what time they opened that. Nyman's is noted, it was a it's noted for the house that caught fire 100 years ago. The, the, uh, the uh, walls are still there. The roof is gone. But it was a very nice garden. They had a small old rock garden in the back. They have a number of perennial beds, perennial walkways. We were there in June. The, uh, you know, this is one of those things about being at the right place at the right time. You know, if you happen to go in mid in summer, that's what you would see. So if you're going to look at perennials in bloom, we were there too early. But uh, that's one of those things, and I'll show some other slides where we were there too late. But uh, it is one of those things when you're planning a garden trip, you've got to define what it is that you want to see, where you're going to go, and what's the best time to do it in. We also went to Sussex Prairie Garden, which is a fairly new garden that uh, is privately owned. It operates as a nursery. It's probably kind of like Tony Avent in terms of some folks who really enjoy planting and wanted to have a display garden as a, well as a nursery. You know, there's some stuff in bloom, uh, like the peonies there in front. But this also is a case where we were there too early to, to get full benefit of it. Uh, I did see, sometimes things catch your attention. This display against one of the, the fences there caught my attention. And I went up to look to see what it was. From a distance, I could tell it was birds flying across the front. But I was like, man, what has somebody done here? And I thought this was a very creative way to use a, a one-quart milk bottle. Uh, where they had simply <coughs> cut it. Some of the marking on here is paint, but they had cut out one side, used it for one of the sides for each of the wings. This is the rest of the body. 
they had cut out the uh, or cut away part of the fourth side, but then curled it back up and painted the head. Uh, and I thought in terms of rather than taking an old milk bottle and then turning it into industrial carpeting or whatever they do with old milk bottles, uh, it was an interesting piece of yard art. Uh, we went to the uh, Harold Hillier Garden, which uh, Hans, when he was here, I know one of the plants he mentioned, and I didn't write it down, uh, was associated with Harold Hillier, who was a plant explorer from the 1940s up until the late uh, 20th century. It's a very large garden. When he passed, he passed it on in trust to the uh, the Hampshire County. Uh, they put out a, a weekly map. The numbers down here are what they viewed as being in bloom at the time, or some of the best specimen plants to look at. But again, this all the gardens I'm talking about here, I guess I forgot to mention, it. we were at 9 minutes at 10 o'clock in the morning. We were at Sussex at 1 o'clock in the afternoon because they didn't open until 1. And here we are at Hilliard's at, at 5 o'clock. So trying to cram a lot of stuff in. Uh, you know, I said it's a very nice perennial walkway. Uh, the guy at the ticket counter when we got there said that until Q expanded their garden, their perennial walkway, this was the longest walkway in the UK. He was quite proud of that. And it is generally a very nice garden, but I would also say that sometimes a garden like this wants to have a little bit of everything. So they had put in a uh, crevice garden, which I have to say was probably one of the least interesting crevice gardens I've seen. Mm -hmm. They had kind of a, a dark mulch soil here. They put in some slabs, bought some tan sand, and put some succulents in it. Uh, and just in terms of contrast to the rest of it, I thought they could do better than that. Uh, so we went on this, we got to Southampton, caught the, the cruise ship. We had a number, I've got a number of nice photos from the cruise, but they weren't botanical garden per se. Went to Bodnot, which uh, is in northern Wales, right on. Uh, probably of the gardens we visited in terms of just visual appeal, probably the most attractive garden we went to. Uh, this is one of the uh, the sculptures, the uh, made with with small limbs and cuttings. Uh, you can see the calamias in bloom, which means that the azaleas were passed. One of the uh, things that the garden is noted for is a, is a Liburnum archway, uh, which was passed, uh, but still had plenty of appeal in terms of mixed perennial borders, grasses, uh, very attractive while we were there. So it is a case where, depending on what you're looking for, you can find a nice garden will look good anytime. We also went, the next day we went to a small town of Fishguard and went to Pembrokeshire along the coast, which I wish just a very, all along the coast in, in Pembrokeshire, you can, there's a walkway, a path that you can walk on for miles and miles. It's very attractive native plant areas. And we also went to a, a small private garden uh, called Griffin Vernant, uh, which was, you know, attractive, but you know, it was in a matter of a few acres. Uh, we then went over to to Ireland, and we went to a couple of gardens south of Dublin. One of which was. Mount Usher Garden, and again the calamia were in bloom. Were in bloom. There were some of the uh, magnolias were in bloom. 
but there was some primrose that bloomed, but basically we were there too late. Most of the plants that Mount Usher is best noted for, we were really, should have been there a couple of weeks earlier. So we've gone from being at Mount Usher because of what's growing there. We were a couple of weeks too late. Uh, in the case of Southern England, such as Diamonds, we were there too early. It's just part of the, what, the nature of traveling and, and uh, seeing different areas. One of the things we did was, you know, if you've been to Ireland, uh, I guess it consists of a couple of things. One is very busy freeways. Uh, another thing is very narrow roads with hedgerows growing on both sides such that you know, there's hardly room for a car, much less encountering a second car. Uh, but a lot of it's fairly flat. It looks fairly, you know, and, you know, not all that appealing. But when we went from Mount Usher over to the next garden we went to, I said, let's take a shortcut, which turned out to be short, but, you know, that's time saving, you know. When we traveled, Google Maps is a great tool to take, and Google Maps said, don't go that way. Uh, but you got up in the mountains and just very scenic area to, to drive through. I was glad we did it, but I was glad because my wife's the driver in the family. <laughs> uh, we, went to Hunting, we next went to Huntingbrook, and uh, perhaps uh, some of you remember Jimmy Blake talking to our chapter. Four or five years ago, Jimmy has a garden there. Uh, again, was delighted to have us come visit, uh, and it was it was very nice to, to see Jimmy again. So that's one of the aspects when I say it's about the people you meet along the way. In fact, we got to go to Ian Young's, and Ian, you know, it's his private residence. He doesn't let people come generally. Uh, but was just a delight to see him the same way with Jimmy. What I really wanted to spend time on from a mechanical standpoint is going to the Burren, uh, which I will say is one of the most amazing places to visit from a, from a plantsman standpoint that I've been to. It's a native plant area. If you, this is Dublin, here's Galway. If you go to the south, there, there's an area that's got, was overlaid with limestone. It's got a slate in places. Some of the areas there are, are acidic. Ireland in general is acidic, but because of the limestone in the Burren area, it's, uh, it has a different pH in the soil. Uh, it's just a because of the nature of, of what's there, it's just an amazing place. Uh, it's warmed and cooled by the westerly winds from the Atlantic, uh, from the Gulf Stream. You know, the daily average temperatures in January are 43 degrees, and in July it's 59 degrees. So there's some <coughs> fluctuation in daily temperatures, but not all that much. It doesn't, it rarely freezes there, but it rarely gets all that warm. It's highly fractured limestone with localized areas where there's soil, peat, shale, that change, changes not just drainage and other stuff, but the, the pH of the soils. Uh, there's some depressions that in the wintertime fill up with, with water and over the course of the summer they will drain. So you've got plants that, that have adapted to that. Uh, there's botanic diversity. There's about a thousand different plant species in, in Ireland. Uh, about 700 of those exist within the Burren. Plants that are, some of the plants that are there are normally found in Arctic areas. There's some that come from Mediterranean climates. There's some from Alpine climates. It's one of those places where you find this mixture of plants that you really couldn't find it elsewhere. And while none of these plants are unique to the Burren, you can find them elsewhere, just their abundance in this area. 
makes it amazing. We took a, finally, you can go any time of year, but especially in May through August, if you want to see plants and flower. Like I said, we originally wanted to go in early May. We ended up going in late June. Uh, and I was, we spent about two, two, two or three hours with our guide, and it was just amazing, two or three hours. But the area is made up of several different habitats. You've got woods and grassland areas. You've got what they refer to as pavement, which is basically these flat areas where you've got limestone beds. In some cases, you've got some soil mixed that's settled in those areas where other plants can grow. They also have what they call turlocks, which are, if you can see this area right up here, this is a lake uh, that was still had water in it in June. But it's much, the lake is much larger if you're there in March or April. It shrinks <coughs> down and a lot of the turlocks go dry by the end of the summer. So you've got different habitats. Uh, this is a photo that I got from our tour guide. If we've been there in May, the uh, spring gentian is one of the plants that the area is noted for, but it is a May bloomer. Things that we saw, and, and these are photos that I took with my iPhone. I was delighted with how amazing an iPhone can be in terms of taking photos. Uh, a number of different, there's 24 different ground orchid varieties within the, the uh, the burren, who's the common spotted orchid, O'Kelly's spotted orchid, Pugley's marsh orchid. Uh, there's uh, some other uh, this pyramidal orchid, this Orpheus, Epiphera, this bee orchid. Uh, you know, and it's given the name bee orchid because of the, the shape of the, the flower. We also have another orchid called a fly orchid that looks like a fly, uh, but it was past season for that orchid to be. We couldn't find it. The, uh, there's also a number of non orchids. Uh, it's just you walk along, and it's one of these places that every step you take, you find something different. Uh, and I guess in summary, uh, you know, this is a list, the, the handouts you got is a list of the, uh, the gardens we visited with websites if you want to learn more. So with that, I will be glad to answer any questions. Jeremy, what is the I mean, the ADU. Was it? For the one of the plants, had to be said it was something from the ADU. Oh, that's just aggregate. Can you repeat the question for us, Dave? Uh, he was asking about this Euphrasia, uh, this eyebright. Uh, there's a number of eyebrights tend to to, uh, to hybridize. And so rather than saying that what's happening, and it's an annual, it's not that these are different species. There's just a host of different hybridized varieties that have intermixed, and I guess I've never seen the term before, but they were simply referred to as an aggregate. Because they it's hard to distinguish one from the other. I've, one of the people we met there is a professional botanist, but she said, unless you get down and start looking in careful detail, you really can't identify what's what. So a lot of times they just call it aggregate. Marilyn? But you said there at the Burren that your guide said <clears throat> so and so. Was it just you and Carol and then you found somebody local to be your guide? How did uh, you go about doing that? Well, we have picked the guide ahead of time. His name's Tony Kirby. It's, uh, he has a website called Walks of the Burren. Uh, Tony has been doing, doing guiding for probably 20 years. Uh, very knowledgeable on plants. He's not a professional botanist, but Tony put me in touch with with uh, a professional botanist as well. Uh, but Tony, just in terms of guiding skills, 
you know, if you want to go to the, the Burren, and he will do it. He doesn't do just botanical tours if, if you want more of the history and geology, a general overview. He does tours on other <coughs> topics. And there's a number of other guides in the Burren area, but Tony, if you're doing botanical tours, I'd highly recommend. It turns out Jimmy Blake's sister also does tours in the Burren area. I just wondered how you found such people generally uh, in a place. Off the list, off of the internet. I was wondering if anybody's been able to grow any of those orchids here. I have no idea. <laughs> I have planted those jackets or whatever you call them before that they just didn't make it to me and I wondered if it just go up and one. I couldn't tell you. You know, that area is where those are growing are probably a higher pH than we have here. I was talking to Cindy earlier, a lot of bulbs are need a more you know, alkaline soil than we have. So it's, I don't know if it's a pH issue or other stuff, but certainly they have a much more moderate climate than we do as well. And what I bought, I bought from out on the west coast, so that's probably Yeah, yeah. Gentia, um, the picture of gentia you showed, right. I've never seen one open. Is that because that's a, the variety, Verna? Yeah, that's a spring. There's, there's a number of gentians. This is spring gentian. Uh, Gentiana Verna. It's specific to that time. <coughs> I don't know if anybody who was on the the uh, we saw the yeah, did you see the autumn yeah, yeah. Yeah. which is very similar. Yeah. There, I think there's certain varieties where they never truly open, which may be what you have. Yeah. But um, there are varieties that do open. Yeah. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, did you get around only by driving or also by transportation? Uh, yeah, we basically got around by driving. We driving. Carolyn driving. Uh, Is she for hire? <laughs> I'm not sure she wants to do it for me. Uh, I will say that Ireland, and, well, two things. We went from southern Scotland to northeast Scotland in a day with several garden stops along the way. And we arrived at Carolyn's cousin's house about three minutes late, which you know, we were going down some, you know, I forgot if they're called ABCs or what the category is, but we were on sea level roads going 65 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we were within the speed limit, but still it's like, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, Carol Grove. Any other questions, comments? I will say in terms of the, the plant sale that, uh, brought up. That is a, a major fundraiser for the organization. I, as Bobby said, I also serve as treasurer and I will attest to the fact that, that the uh, plant sale is a major fundraiser for us every year. So when you go home, if you got some plants, give that, spend a little time. Thank you.